Welcome back to the Budding Author Podcast with me, your host, Simon Ward. Today, we're talking to a young adult sci-fi writer. That's Dylan West, former Navy nuclear operator. How you doing, Dylan? Yeah, okay. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's brilliant, brilliant. Um, first and foremost, um, how long have you been writing for and what got you into writing? All right. Well, the first thing you should know is I used to hate reading and I used to hate writing for the first 13 <laughs> years of my life um, because it was all for a grade. You know, I was held at GPA point by my teachers. Um, but then I read one, exactly one novel that changed my whole life. And everybody's like, oh, what is this? <laughs> it, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Red Wall series by Brian Jacques. Um, it's the got Red a few creatures on the cover. Um, the book was Salamander Strong. Yeah. It's the first book that I ever read just because I wanted to and not because I was made to for a grade. Yeah. And yeah. it showed me how fascinating books could be. In other words, I, I finally understood what all the fuss was about with yeah. books. <laughs> and that yeah. was at age 14, and I've been writing, reading and writing ever since. In fact, reading that one book turned me into a novelist almost overnight. Blimey, that's uh, that's some good book. We'll put a link in the description for that book for anybody that didn't yeah. quite get it. Um, yeah. so I think it's only we. Pro it's good that we promote other authors, obviously. Yeah. Um, what what's been your biggest challenge so far? Uh, well, I think over the long the the whole thirty years that I've been writing novels, the single biggest thing was finding feedback and knowing what in the world to do during revisions. Now, yeah. in the last, I would say five years, I feel like I have mostly solved that problem. Um, and, um, and I can tell you what I did to solve it too um, and keep it solved. It's something that I feel like, it's a different approach than what a lot of people use. Um, okay. yeah, just knowing where to find critique partners because going around to my friends and family was not cutting it. You know, they they weren't they didn't have time. They um, were very slow. And when they finally did give feedback, it was very sparse, very general. Oh, oh, this was nice. Or uh, this part, you know, uh, and, and it, it didn't give me much to take action on. The. Um, my first book, Finding Love in 2045, um, I got carried away with um, sex scenes. <laughs> <laughs> and um and i think i put a few writers off with that to be honest and um so i re i re-edited and took the heat level sort of much down to a much more manageable level and i think it was the not the right kind of uh beta readers that sort of put it in front of it um my wife um had said it wasn't her kind of book um but i knew she wasn't a sci-fi fan um so i sort of took it as sort of that side of it but um she wasn't perhaps uh, graphic enough with me and um, so uh, how you fix that then uh, did it so uh, i found this online community called scribefile.com i don't know Scribe if you've heard of it mm -hmm. and you know i can provide you that link later but yeah, okay. it's a place where you create a profile and you critique other authors to earn karma points, that's what they call it. And then you spend those karma points to post your own work, you generally one chapter at a time. It's it's 3,000 words. So whether that's a short story or you know a chapter or, or even a half a chapter, you post those and you get feedback in return. And a lot of authors get discouraged when they join sites like this because they complain it takes lots of critiques and lots of time critiquing other people in order to get their own stuff critiqued yeah. and they feel like well that's time that i could have been revising or writing my own work i'm having to take the time away for somebody else's and i've thought about this and i realized that the act of critiquing other people's work has done more for me than even the feedback i get from other people um, because every time I critique other people's work, it sharpens my own editorial eyes. So when I go back to my own work, it's like all the mistakes, all the annoyances that 
others were doing in their chapters. Now I can ping, I can just see them leaping off the page in my own work. I'm like, oh man, I better fix this before I, you know, before I put yeah. this back up there. I am. I think you're spot on there, Dylan. Um, the reason I was smiling is because I I ran a writing group and um, I said I saw that a lot. Um, reading other people's work and seeing the errors in their work and think, well, hang on, was mine like that? And you sort of, but um, what I found with the writing group, I'm not sure about uh, the scriber file, people weren't critical enough because people are generally polite. Yeah. And I I called it the shark tank because I wanted people to bite. Um, But I still don't feel the people sort of criticise my writing enough. Um. See, in the writing group, I think almost without exception, I had a couple of comments, but the majority were like, oh, this is brilliant. We love it. Mm. And then um, it can't be that brilliant or people that now be, it'd be flying off the shelves, wouldn't it? But uh, uh, gaining traction as a writer is quite tough, isn't it? Are you talking about in terms of marketing and getting sales and a following? Yeah, yeah. Um, it can be. I feel like... I ran across the the best marketing gurus when I was getting ready to launch and I've been following their advice and it's been really helping me. I'm yeah. not a New York Times bestseller, but my numbers are actually pretty steady and pretty solid. So, um, and I can definitely share some of that experience with you if, if you'd like. Yeah, well, as, as, part of your, as part of your day job, you're a programmer, aren't you now? I am. Yeah. Um, so as part of that, you'll have like a structure and a process that you'll follow for each job. And I would guess marketing for you is the same. Tell me. There are, you know, actually, I do use some programming in my own marketing stuff, but mostly for the financials. Like I can track everything in a Google spreadsheet. And because I know Excel and I know, you know, the formulas, I can go in and you know customize all my reporting exactly yeah. the way I want. But yeah, that structured mindset does help for sure with the writing too. The um, I find because a lot of our readers are coming from Amazon. Um, I presume it's the same for yourself. No. Oh the no! Vast, where, where are most of your readers coming from? The vast majority of my readers walk by my table at either the Portsmouth Farmers Market or the Virginia Beach Farmers Market. Ah, got you. I'm usually nestled between a fire hydrant and a guy selling leather belts or necklaces or something. That is, that's not typical for authors, is it? <laughs> uh, most most authors uh, don't want to see people. That's sort of the reason they're right is because they don't want to face the world and uh, face the public. They want to create their own stories and uh, in their own mind. Well, um, I have uh, run a few failed businesses before this one where I learned how to sell and market, you know, just trying to do, do I've done a little bit of door to door, not a whole lot. I've done a lot of just cold calling and like, so I've had lots of sales experience and that really helps me with this. So when you think of, for me, a local fate, a local fair, um, maybe I should buy some books on Amazon. Uh printed books and take them and sell them at a fair. What do you think? You think that's a good route for me? So I'll, I'll give you my philosophy. I never leave my front door unless it's to cut grass. Um, I never leave my front door without wearing my Scribes Descent t-shirt or Scribes of Flame or Emulsification. One of my book covers, I have a shirt for every, that matches the one the cover for every single one of them. And I go and I carry the book in my hand. Everywhere I go, restaurants, really? theaters, church, I mean, it doesn't matter. If you see me out of my house without my book, you can call me out on it. Be like, oh, you're not you're not battle dressed, Dylan. What happened to you? Right. And I have my backpack. I kid you not. I have 12 copies of my books on my back all the time. You're so a I machine. Sell lots you're of a copies. selling machine. I am. I am the book peddler. So it's not just about one event here or there. It's just a mindset, a constant, like yeah. I build this into me that every person I see, if the deliver, if like 
the Fox pest control guy comes to my door. My book is in my hand. And when he asks me, hey, do you want me to spray your back patio? I'll be like, yeah. And also, do you like sci-fi? You know? <laughs> but yes, I, Simon, I would definitely recommend every author to at least try one local in-person event. Yeah. Honestly, try more than one, but at least one. Um, I, I have contacted the uh, the local libraries and uh, I'm planning to do a, a book tour of the local libraries over the summer. Um, so sort of that's kicking off in uh, June, so uh, or middle of okay. June. So, so and I, I have some, ad some advice about what events to select. If some authors get put off because they set up, they invite people to come to a signing at like a local bookstore, and if that bookstore doesn't have a lot of built-in natural traffic and they're really only counting on the 40 people that you invited, if only 10% of those people actually come, which is high, it's a high percentage, then that's four people. You got, four, you know, so like uh, most times when an author invites only like 40, 50 people, nobody shows up and then they get really discouraged. Yeah. What I tell these authors is don't do book signings that way. Don't go to locations where you're inviting 50 people and that's it. Like go to a farmer's market that they have hundreds and hundreds of people already going every weekend. Yeah. It's built in traffic, you know, you, and then you just have to call out to those people. And when they, you know, when they stop and look, reach out with your book and put it in their hand. Footfall, isn't it? Without footfall, you have no chance. Yeah, you got to have foot traffic. Yeah. Right. And the, if you can get a venue where the table is not super expensive, like my farmer's markets, I pay $20 yeah. for like a five hour event. $20 to call out to about 50, uh, five, uh, 500 to 1,000 people in those five hours. And on average, I sell between 12 and 30 books in an afternoon, morning, afternoon. Oh, that's that's quite a bit, you know, and I do that four times a month. That's like between 60 and 100 books. In yeah, a and you're making what, two, $2 a book perhaps? Um, I actually make six dollars of profit per book. Um, so I'll end up making anywhere from one hundred to five hundred dollars of revenue and about forty to two hundred dollars in profit, depending on just how many sales e each event. I think maybe where I may have been going wrong. I do talk to people about my books quite often now. It, I've sort of got past the point of being scared to talk to people about my books. Um, okay. But because the book's available on ebook, I will I'll sort of tell people, yeah, it's on Amazon, on ebook, and that sort of thing. But then you're relying on them to go go away and, and oh, do something different. If yeah. you've got a book in the hand, it's like, have a look at this book. Yes, you want your physical copy right there because you're exactly right. 99.9999% of the people, you say, oh, just go look on Amazon. They never do it. Or if they do, and then they get distracted. Definitely never count on that. That's why having the on hand. And then if you have the on hand copy, you can sign it right in front of them and personalize it to them. So that makes it even more special. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I need to start doing that. I think I am. Um, maybe. I think I'm, I'm getting when I get my books printed, I'm going through uh, Amazon to do that. I do. Um, too. Pardon? I do, you, too. You use KDP. You, yeah. So I think. But we, we need to limit, from my point of view, I'm careful to limit my spend. So live, limit my exposure. Um, so I think maybe sort of grab sort of 20 copies and then sort of sell 20 and then buy another 20 sort of thing. I started out that way. Now I buy them by the hundreds because um, I just know after doing this for two years and ha having sold over 2,100 copies in that time, at, um, and I'm a regular vendor at one of my markets, which, you know, I'm guaranteed a spot now. It used to be I was on a standby list. Yeah. And I'd only get in if the main vendor didn't show. But now I'm, you know, the main vendor for my, and I have an assigned spot. It's really great. Um, so I, I can almost count on selling at least 50 books every month. It's almost a guarantee, unless there's bad weather. Or I'm really sick one, you know, a couple of weeks. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll tell a very short story of one book signing I did. Um, there was a, a coffee morning at the local library. 
and uh, they're expecting sort of 40 50 people there for this coffee morning and um i thought yeah and it was well publicized around and uh, the morning of the coffee signing coffee signing now the book signing even um the heavens opened and uh, there was a, a real bad storm and yeah. nobody came to the coffee morning yeah i had like three people turn up in the end and it was like ah oh. but i lost heart with that and i think that's that's where i'm sort of approaching it again I need to sort of push again and go to a busier library and a, a spectrum yeah. and have a have a, a tour planned rather than sort of a, a one hit you need more than one hit don't you to uh, make a home run i think oh yeah um just um we've reached sort of halfway stage um we are going to talk more about your process and um and particular tips that you've picked up but uh what, what's your key thing at the moment which is your your main book that you're promoting at the moment well it, it usually is scribes dissent the poster you see in the back and you can hold the book where you can actually see it this oh, is yeah. the entry point to the main series so this is the one that i i promote mainly okay i think for me for me it would be time to click time to click was the um the third book in the series but it's set before the first two so it's now book one and the lead into the series <laughs> um what we can also say for the podcast um this goes out on youtube um but we also have the audio podcast and we also have clips going out on uh, TikTok, um also on youtube shorts and um instagram and facebook um i was just looking just before we came on air um one of our authors that came on um jen mcleod she's coming back on shortly to talk about book marketing campaigns um that's had well in excess of six and a half thousand views which is absolutely remarkable so i'm really chuffed the way things are going with the show and uh, we are looking for sponsors for the show. We have had uh, some support from Barry Collins, as sort of uh, paid for our podcast for the year. So that's very good. But we are welcoming uh, Patreons that sort of help support the channel. So uh, you can get in touch. Uh, there'll be a link in the description for that. But Dylan, let's get back to the meaty stuff. Um, tell me about your process. You say part of the programming for your writing. That has also helped you. So uh, what's your writing process? Well, I do massive like Tolkien levels of world building. So when I'm ready to make a new book, um, I look first at, you know, is this going to take place in the scribe verse, which is the universe I've already been building for the last 13 plus years. Um, so then I just go and find the relevant pieces of lore and all of that within my big world building document which is you know it's fifty five thousand words long i have my own silmarillion going going um and or if it's in a totally different universe then i just figure out do i need to create a new universe or is this going to be our own universe and what fields of science do i need to go and um, research in order to prepare to even start writing notes before i even start outlining that book i mean i do like months and months of like just just to give you an example one of my books world of me it um stars a colony of bacteria in the gut of a teenage boy that is able to make first contact with his human host by tapping the vagus nerve loud enough for the boy to hear right so already this is very exotic you don't see very really any other books where a microorganism is the point of view character, right? <laughs> so that all automatically imposes an enormous research research burden on my part to, you know, no microbiology, no gastroenterology, no immunology, right? Like all of those ologies that are going to be relevant to that book, I have to I had to spend six months just before I even started outlining the book. And then I had to spend a few more months even afterwards. And I'm working through a huge microbiology textbook right now every day um, just to go back and inject even more realism. Um, so I'm really heavy science with yeah. this. It, there's, sure. some strange, it. there's some strange subjects we get into on uh, on researching books, isn't there? I think oh, yeah. from I was, I was going to say for my uh, for my three in my awakening series, um, four years of uh, study of future technologies was sort of a big part of that but in time to click part of my work for that 
made my search history look quite strange. Um, so the process of how a body degrades is, is not pleasant oh. reading. It's not pleasant <laughs> reading, but it sort of it formed part of what was required for the book. So where uh, the photos were you looking at pictures of cadavers and things? There? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was. Um, it's the the start of the book is actually sort of uh, quite gruesome in some respects. Um, the, fir the first book sort of starts off more like an adventure and uh, and it's a romantic drama that sort of steps into sci-fi and then the others are more more and more sci-fi the deeper you go into the series. Um, oh, it's brilliant. <laughs> the um, Your first draft, how long will that take when you actually start writing your first draft then, Dylan? It depends on what's all going on in my life at the time. When I'm pretty heavily taxed at work, then I can usually put a thousand words a day during the Monday to Friday. And then yeah. I can do maybe 1,500 or 2,000 words on Saturday, Sunday. And not, not Saturdays now, because I'm doing sales events every Saturday. I come home wiped out from that. But on Sundays, I'll generally try to put one to 2,000 words. If I have an unusually light load during my day job for some reason, then I can do like 2,000 words a day, even during Monday to Friday. But, you know. so, you do, so you're doing that when you get home, yeah? Yes, usually, usually quite late. And I'm usually deadlifting, bench pressing or squatting. And then while I'm resting between sets of those in my garage, and I have a gym in my garage, I come back to my desk and write for another 10 minutes, you know, while I'm resting oh, and I can get another set in. I could not do that. I could not do that at all. For me, for me, I mean, all the all my other tasks for the day need to be completed. I have, a, I have a list in my diary of jobs that need to be done, and I need to complete all of those before I can concentrate to write. And hmm. um, so, with that in mind, I don't write every day. I need to have my uh, my my mind needs to be clear of other distractions to be able to sort of get into it. And then, if I'm having a day fully into it, I can sort of do like three, four thousand words. But that's good. But quite often, quite often, time because of other things time dictates that um it's going to be nearer a thousand or fifteen hundred but again there's days when i don't write it's writing every day is a challenge isn't it um it can be especially if you have if you've gotten out of the practice in a while uh getting back into it once you're back into the flow i find that it's easy to keep keep going you know once i've established that habit it's like building that endurance back up yeah um, and part yeah. of the word count that I do. So I know some people talk about writer's block and they go, well, then there goes my word count because now I'm stuck. Right. For me, um, if I get to a point where I'm not sure about some decision, some plot point, I will just switch over in Scrivener. That's the tool I use. But even if I don't use Scrivener, I, I can just open up a different document and start just typing up questions to myself ideas notes yeah. you know and then and i count all that toward my daily word count yeah. so even if i did like if i got stuck for a whole day where i'm just writing you know 1000 words of questions and notes and ideas and, and options for what to do next yeah, i consider that a success and then the next day hey i might just totally be done now with the uh, you know figuring things out and i can just get back to the manuscript i think that makes sense I think that makes sense because it's all part of the process, isn't it? The, the mm -hmm. font, we can almost went during the editing phase, any words that you deleted and come off your writing thing. It's all part of the process, isn't it? Um, do you finish the whole draft before you do any editing or do you sort of check and go sort of thing? Um, so what I tell people is if something occurs to me, like let's say I'm in chapter 20 and I realize the scene I'm writing now that there is something that I need to put back in an earlier chapter to make this thing make sense. Yeah. I better go and put it back there now while I'm still thinking about it, because if I put it off till later, I might forget, yeah. you know, or I can put it in a to-do list if it's like yeah. a big thing. Right. But it's one of those things where while I'm thinking about it, I better go do it, especially if it's a quick thing. And then I just come back and just keep going. But I don't like, go and obsessively revise like earlier nah, I don't think about that too much yeah i think i i try to stick the keep focused on it because of my i think my, my attention span is such i need to maintain focus so 
as I'm writing it, I if I'm referring to someone earlier in the story, um, if their name doesn't immediately come to me, I'll just put Mr. X question 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 mark several times and um and then who came from and then I'll put question question and then carry on writing and then sort it out later with my editing. But um it's everybody's process is different, I think, as long as you're writing and uh, getting your writing critiqued is uh is important i think we all know the x factor thing where their mom tells them how great they are and then they go in front of the judges and the judge is like have you ever sang to anybody other than your mom it's like nope well you should <laughs> <laughs> so uh so that is that is a tough one i think it's a bit like that with writing as well we can surround ourselves if we're not careful with people that just say yeah it's great carry on going um and that's dangerous but mm. i think my sort of biggest disappointment at the moment is people are either reading my book and um not liking it or reading my book and commenting and saying yeah it's brilliant it's great so that if anybody's reading it and not liking it they haven't told me that because everybody that says they've read my book have told me how great it is and they're really happy um so I don't know whether I'm in a, a cloud and um, I don't know whether I'm. Well, I can tell you what I've done to solve those issues for my for my own work. Um, so some people I've noticed that some indie authors, the only time they get feedback is when they send stuff out to beta readers. And I think that's way too late. Yeah. Um, what I do is I send an alpha copy to one guy. His name is Philip Nelson. He's been my alpha reader and my yeah. main cheerleader and even my financial backer for 13 years. This, he's read every draft, almost every draft of all of these books that I've published. And so I get feedback from the concept level. Like when I've outlined, I sent him my outline. Okay, so if, yeah. there's, if there's something structurally off with my outline, he usually is pretty good about helping me catch those problems before I even yeah. start drafting. And then he reads the first draft or pretty close to it. And then helps me to see some major structural problems right then. And after all of that, then I post chapters up on scribefile.com. And I don't just get feedback from like one or two people. I get feedback from hundreds of people. Yeah, from right. Scribe, uh, uh, Scribe Descent, I got 550 critiques from 350 different authors over a four-year period. And I knew that that book was ready to publish when I started seeing new authors who were critiquing my stuff say, I, I think this is ready to go. In fact, my wallet is flopping open. Where can I buy this? When I yeah. kept seeing that kind of feedback, because that did not happen at the beginning. Yeah. And that, that took like a few years of hearing, oh, fix this, fix this. you know. And then finally, after four years, I started hearing a lot of, where can I buy this? Um, and that's when I knew, okay, it's it's ready. Um, but when you get lots and like dozens and dozens and dozens of people critiquing your stuff, what I found is that, yeah, I get a lot of people that are like, oh yeah, this is, you know, this is nice. Or they're just like looking at spelling and puncture and grammar, you know, the spag, um, the low line fruit, that's easy to comment on, right? Um, but maybe one to three percent of my critique partners are amazing. They can find stuff like structural, pacing, character, you know, harder to catch things, even the stuff that's missing. That's the yeah. hard, single hardest thing to find as a critique partner is to see what is not here that should be. Because anybody can find like something that's wrong, that's right on the page, right? But once you've found a critique partner who can put their finger on a page and go, this is missing something, that's gold. I. I like I take care of that critique partner, you know, because <laughs> I want to keep them right. So getting enough critique partners means that the per the small percentage of really good ones, you know, still measures out to be you know five ten people, and that's significant. Yeah. You can get five or ten really hot shot critique partners looking at your stuff consistently that you you found something good. I think um, I think I had someone do a critique recently. And uh, they just pointed out a, a couple of missing commas. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's subjective, isn't it? Well, I'm not. I mean, that that is important. But um, 
but I'm talking about like missing this scene is missing tension. This scene is missing uh, yeah, yeah. um a promise. It's not making a promise to the reader that it should, or it's making the wrong promise. Yeah. Or this scene is supposed to feel sad, but right now I feel nothing. And uh, I think yeah. it's because of this, this, and this, right? So like finding that stuff. That's I need, to get, I, I need to get into this scriber file. We've got the link in the description. Yeah, in the yeah, description yeah. And we'll get into that. Lord, you have to spend, you know, you have to be hot critiquing a lot of other people to get them to reciprocate. And it's just a numbers game, right? Like I've critiqued hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people out there. I've spent like, I've written almost a half million words of critique in my five years there. So yeah. it's not the easy, it's not the easy button for sure. But yeah, do you find that do you find the standard is good? Um, you mean like as far as the quality of the critiques from other people? No, I mean well, the quality of other people's writing. Oh, it's all over the place. You know, ah. there's some people on there that are just blow my head off. I have to go find my socks because they blew them off my feet. And then there's people on there that's total garbage. And you got everything in between. It's just you yeah. Know. So I think I've had uh, with the writing group I had, uh, but I get it with lots of printed books. Um, I really find it hard going. I'm I'm not sort of a natural reader. I think yeah. um, my own writing is sort of quite fast paced. Mm, so if too. if I'm reading something that sort of maybe is over complex and over wordy, oh, I just I struggle. I struggle with it. And um, I can remember I was I'm doing a critique in the Shark Tank for. One, I think it was a, it might have been a 3,000, it might have even been a 10,000 word uh, submission. And um, I, I'm sort of probably 3,000 words in it. And it was like, what has happened? Nothing's happened. And like for me, 3,000 words is like, that's two chapters. The whole world has changed in that time. <laughs> and that's, um, <laughs> Dylan, Dylan, we've sort of run out of time, which is, uh, testament to uh what a great guest you've been and um i can understand fully how well you're doing and why you're doing it and how well you're succeeding so uh i wish you all the best for uh continued success hopefully our association will just rub off onto me a little bit <laughs> but i will definitely be getting involved with this scriber file and um sort of leveling up as it were that's brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. Thank yeah. you, Simon. It's been a pleasure. That's been my pleasure too. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, the uh, show will also be out on audio podcast and we'll have some clips coming up on TikTok as well. You can find me on Simon Ward Stories on TikTok um, and Simon Ward Author on Instagram. <sighs> Excellent stuff. Thanks for watching, everybody.